It's really a pleasure to be here tonight. It's quite an unusual place for a university lecturer to be speaking. My colleagues are making a lot of jokes this week about, you know, my career has descended into lecturing in pubs now. I've left the realms of the lecture theatre. The question I, I sort of put out there when I was asked to do this um, session was, was, is sequestration a band-aid solution or is it a silver bullet that will solve all our problems? So the idea of sequestration is essentially doing the reverse of what I'm trained to do. My training, my professional expertise and heritage is in petroleum engineering. I have a PhD in petroleum engineering from um, Stanford University in the States. Kicked around the States for a while and, and taught and eventually found my way home. And while I was in the States, the focus of everything I was doing was about extracting oil and gas from the ground. What I'm using this talk to talk about is can those petroleum engineering skills be used in reverse to take a gas like carbon dioxide and put it back in the ground and keep it in the ground, preferably for at least a thousand years. So band-aid or silver bullet, that's the question to keep in mind with what I'm doing. So I want to orient people to the idea of how oil reservoirs are formed because oil reservoirs are actually really good targets for places to store CO2. So oil reservoirs are formed when uh, plant, mainly plant remains, some animal remains, but it's unlikely you've got the remains of a dinosaur in your petrol tank right now. You've probably got a bunch of sort of dead seaweed and swamp type material. And when that plant or animal matter accumulates in a perhaps a swampy area or at the bottom of an ocean, bottom of a river, and is eventually buried by sediment. So sediment being particles of rock and sand, you get this organic matter being buried with sediment. And you can think of sediment like sand grains on the beach. As enough sediment builds up, that organic matter becomes trapped and is eventually heated through processes in the earth and it is subjected to more and more pressure as more and more sediment flows through the system so we're thinking over hundreds of millions of years um, through the same processes that form mountains and lakes and rivers. So this organic material is heated and cooked and it is trapped inside rocks. Now if we could look at this rock under a microscope, what would we would see is actually something quite different. We would see a network of solid material interspersed with void spaces and those void spaces they're the prize. They're the space inside this rock where you may be storing oil and gas or where you may be trying to force carbon dioxide to re reside and remain trapped. So that cementation means the spaces in this rock sample are very, very small. Each little space is on the order of 100 microns. So a micron is one millionth of one metre. So we're talking spaces that have diameters on the scale of about a human hair. But under a microscope, about 20 to 25% of the total volume of the sample would be these small void spaces. So that's where we get oil and gas from, that's where we're trying to put CO2 in. Okay, the myth that some people have is that oil is found in these big underground pools and it's a, drilling a well is as easy as essentially putting a straw into a glass and extracting it. It's not, it's in these porous formations. And these pores have to be connected for fluids to flow from one pore to the next and eventually to our well. So I, here I have my no expenses spared model of a porous rock formation. <laughs> Actually very, very gratefully crafted for me by my wonderful husband. Now this rock formation is porous, it's a spongy material. And it has a structure to it. It has this folded structure. And that folded structure would reflect the tectonic history of what had happened to that um, piece of rock. The forces in the earth that have caused earthquakes and mountains to build have bent the rock. So if I drill one well in the system, with get the pointy end of my well, if I drill one well into the system, all I know about is is here. It's like a needle in a haystack. So I know that I've found this geological formation at this depth and it continues to this depth. Now my vision of how this structure um, is formed depends greatly where I draw the next well. 
So, if I drill the next well here, I see the same formation, same depth, both sides. I may consider that that formation is completely flat, that there's been no folding going on in the system. To understand the sort of 3D nature of the system, I would have to drill some more wells. <laughs> I'd see that this formation is intersected at a different depth. The formation is higher here than here. So you see the problem that I'm trying to create a 3D vision of what this formation looks like, but I can only sample it directly at points where I've dr drilled wells, and wells are very, very expensive. So there's a lot of remote sensing work that goes on. So what I want to do with carbon dioxide sequestration, I want to take CO2, which is a greenhouse gas, and I want to put it inside one of those formations. Okay? Greenhouse gas causes global warming, and my aim is to achieve that storage on a, a permanent basis. I want certainty that if I inject the CO2 into that formation that it's going to stay there that it's not going to migrate out and go somewhere undesirable. So there's a few geological targets of things that would be uh, suitable. I could go into old oil and gas reservoirs for me to put carbon dioxide back inside. I can go into deep, unminable coal seams. They're not of economic value because of the depth. They'll never be mined. Chemical um, structure of coal has an affinity to carbon dioxide and it will tend to um, adhere the carbon dioxide to the surface of the coal. So that's another option. Then I can also go into deep saline aquifers. So aquifers are formations that contain water and they contain saline water which is too salt laden for it to be of any valuable for drinking water purposes. So the way that the idea of sequestration actually evolved is from the oil industry. The oil industry have actually quite a long history of injecting carbon dioxide into perfectly good oil reservoirs. They, in the States, drill wells to go and find carbon dioxide deliberately because there are underground formations that naturally contain carbon dioxide. So there's a whole network of wells and pipelines in Texas that are producing carbon dioxide on purpose to inject it into an oil well. Why do you want to do that? Because the Carbon dioxide acts like a solvent, and the solvent, when it mixes into the oil, helps the oil move. Because remember, we're trying to move oil through this network of very, very small pores. Oil tends to be viscous. It doesn't like to move. You've got to apply quite large pressure differentials. So injecting CO2 helps the oil move. If I find an oil reservoir and I don't do anything in terms of injecting other substances like CO2 or water, the amount of oil that I get out is only 5, 15, 20% of what's there. Most of the oil that we've discovered, a good proportion of it, stays underground because we cannot manage to extract it from the rock. So injecting CO2 can help us remove oil. That's one of the, the origins of the idea of sequestration. And it means the oil companies have spent a lot of time learning how to put CO2 in the ground and not wanting to do it for any environmental reason, they've done it to increase oil recovery. Most famous example of that is a project called Wayburn in Canada that's been going since oh, um, late 1990s. They, uh, how are they doing? They have injected 18 million tonnes of CO2 into the oil reservoir. They believe they're going to recover an additional 130 million barrels of oil. So multiply 130 million by the oil price, you can see that we're talking large numbers. The catch is when you burn that 130 million barrels of oil, you produce a whole lot of more CO2. So the enhanced oil recovery process is not really a, a solution, it just delays the CO2 emissions and makes the oil companies some more money. But in return, they've had a good hard look at the technology. And the monitoring efforts on this Wayburn project have been very, very successful. The company made predictions of what would happen and the project is very heavily monitored and it is all the monitoring data that's come back has shown that it's going exactly to plan. What we think should happen is happening. So that should give us a lot more confidence that sequestration um, could work.